Here we go. I've always, uh, as I said in my uh, email to you guys, I've always um, disliked it when I hear uh, titles of, of, you know, particularly books or sermons where it's five steps to this or seven steps to that, because I think, um, you know, life is not that simple. There just aren't, there aren't just five steps to anything, <laughs> you know, really. Um, but uh, we're going to hone in on spiritual maturity today. And um, towards the end of our study, we, we will share five things that can really help us in that uh, maturity. And I don't mean to imply that if you do those five things, then boom, you're spiritually mature. Um, in fact, I've left out uh, some of the most important ones because I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that you already know that. And, and you guys do know that. I, I, I know you well enough to know uh, that you know that you can't be spiritually mature if you're not reading your Bible and not spending time in prayer. Um, so those those are a couple more things that are certain. So the, the, this goes beyond that. But anyway, uh, we're going to be uh, looking over uh, 1 Corinthians 1 through 4, and we're also going to jump over to chapter 13, the love chapter, um, because I think it fits in here. But before we get there, a couple of things by introduction. You remember that the church at Corinth uh, was founded by um, uh, Priscilla, Aquila, Paul, Timothy, and Silas. Paul got there first. When he got there, he was pretty uh, beat up and exhausted, and God in his grace and mercy uh, raised up those other four to come and be around him and help him in the ministry. So together, they founded the church. And Paul stayed there for a year and a half, and then he moved on. And then down the road sometime, he uh, started getting letters and, and hearing about some problems in the church at Corinth. The, the church had grown quite a bit, um, but there were some problems specifically. And, and as we said last time, the book is, is um, uh, uh, divided in, into sections dealing with each of these problems. Uh, so the first problem was that there were these cliques that had developed. Secondly, and we'll look at this next week, uh, there was sexual immorality in the church. Thirdly, there were disputes over food. Uh, there, were, there was chaotic worship. And there were some people who were denying the resurrection, which is where Paul brings this particular letter to a close. So those problems are going on. Um, and because of those problems, it's obvious that the Corinthians were not bearing good fruit. Um, and they were, in spite of, uh, you know, their, their um, auspicious beginning, I mean, my goodness, being founded by the Apostle Paul, and they were off to a good start. Uh, but they were spiritually immature, and they weren't bearing good fruit, um, as evidenced by, um, you know, the divisions that were among them and the uh, the sexual impurity and the chaos and the worship and all the rest of it. Uh, so growing in Christ is is absolutely vital. It's not something that we have a choice over. I think sometimes we, um, uh, not uh, when I say we, I don't mean you and me, but um, I think sometimes uh, as uh, I think sometimes some Christians have given some new Christians the impression, probably without meaning to, that, um, you know, the main thing is to get saved, you know, accept Jesus into your heart, and, uh, and, and then you got, you're on your way to heaven, you got your ticket to heaven, and uh, so, and, and, and then, you know, as an add-on, if, really, if you really want to, uh, then we have this thing called discipleship, and you can grow up, and um, uh, when I was a chaplain, I, I ran into so many people that uh, that essentially was their background. They they were certain that they were going to heaven because they had responded to an altar call, um, you know, way back in the day. Um, but there had been there there was no evidence of spiritual growth. I you know don't want to judge anyone, but uh, you know by the way they were living. So it's not optional. That's my point. Uh, we have to grow up. If if we had a cherry tree that never ever bore any fruit whatsoever, and uh, just sort of sat there, didn't even leaf out, you know, we would assume that it was probably dead after, you know, trying to bring it back for five or six years, and we would probably remove it. 
Um, but first, before we get into all that, we need to answer this question. What is a BEMA? I'm sure you've been wondering that. Um, <laughs> the word comes from 2 Corinthians, uh, the fifth chapter and the 10th verse, where Paul says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Um, the word that's translated judgment seat in, uh, I think this is the new international version that I put up here on the screen. Um, and, and that's what most translations translated the judgment seat of Christ. Um, that word is bema in Greek, B-E-M-A. Um, and I'll tell you about that in just a moment. Um, for we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema, so that each of us may receive what is due for us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now we go over to our text, and if you'll look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 11, and in context here, Paul's talking about all these divisions that were in the church, you know, people saying, well, I'm of Paul, well, I'm of Apollos, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, it, it, his, his argument is that I'm nothing, Apollos is nothing, you know, Peter's nothing. It's all about Jesus. Uh, some of us sow, others of us get to reap, um, but we're all in this together. We're all co-workers in, in God's vineyard, as it were. Uh, and in that context, uh, he says, we're, we're, all, we're all building on a foundation. But he says, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we have already laid. The foundation is Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, King Jesus. That's, that's the central thing. Uh, that's the foundation. Uh, that's the heart. And, and that always must stay, he always must stay central. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, or wood, hay, and uh, wood, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives within you? So Paul is saying that we're all going to stand before the judgment uh, seat of Christ. We're all going to stand before that Bema that he refers to in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And when we do, all of our works are going to be judged by fire, is what he's saying. Uh, and he says, some of our works are going to be like silver, gold, precious jewels. Uh, if you put silver, gold, or precious gems in a refiner's fire, the fire doesn't destroy them. The fire just purifies them. The, the, the dross, the impurities... Uh, from the silver or the gold or the gems burns off. That is consumed. But actually the gold, the silver, the precious gems come out of the fire better than when they went in. On the other hand, if you put wood, hay, or straw into a fire, the fire consumes it. So Paul is saying all of our works, everything that we do as Christians, um, falls into one of two categories. It's either silver, gold, and precious stones, or it's wood, hay, and straw. It's in one of those two categories. It's either going to uh, go through the fire and come out better, or it's going to go through the fire and be consumed. So keep in mind that we're, now we're talking about Christians. We're talking about people who, who have given their lives to Christ, what happens to us after death? Well, our physical body sleeps. And I put that in quotes because, you know, it's not really the same as, as uh, uh, physiological sleep. But uh, Paul uses that word when he, he speaks of, this, of sleeping in death. He's talking about the body, the human body. The minute you die, the instant you die, your spirit, your soul, 
The essence of who you are, your personality, is with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So your body sleeps, as it were, and your spirit and soul are instantly with Jesus. But then somewhere in there, um, you have to stand before the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ. Now, no one who stands before that Bema is going to be condemned. This is not a judgment as in you go to hell. Uh, this, this is the Bema. And, and what's important about that is that word Bema, which we have translated as judgment seat, was the word to describe the um, podium where Olympic awards were given out. So the Olympic Games in ancient Greece were held in a similar way to the way they are today. And, um, you know, they'd had these various contests. And then one by one, the winners would come up. And in those days, they would receive a, a garland. As you can see in the picture, they're placing the garland on the winner's head. So uh, just as it is in the Olympics today, uh, you know, we have the, the podium for the gold, silver, and bronze medals. But the people that came in fourth and fifth and 35th, they're not condemned. They're, they're, there's, they're not punished. There's nothing bad happens to them. It's just that the winners get the prize. So after death, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and our works are going to be judged. We're not saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith. Um, but having um, uh, been saved by grace through faith, we um, hopefully grow and mature in the Lord. Um, we uh, produce God. Uh, we are God's workmanship created by God and formed by God in order to produce good works. And the things that we do that are pleasing to God, uh, they fall into the category of silver, gold, and precious stones. The, uh, the, the garbage stuff that we do from time to time, that falls into the category of wood, hay, and straw. Some of what we do is going to be consumed. Some of what we do is going to uh, be refined and come out better than it was. And then in some future time, according to God's timing, the body that, you know, went to sleep, quote unquote, when we died, is going to be resurrected, physically resurrected. Our spirits and souls will be reunited with our new resurrection bodies. It'll be a body like the one that Jesus had, uh, has. Um, you know, we, he was able to eat fish and touch me and see that I'm, I'm real. I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not a ghost, you know. Um, and yet it'll be a body that's adaptable to the entire universe. Uh, it'll be a body that never gets old, never gets tired, never gets sick, um, and never gets too hot or too cold. <laughs> and it'll be a body that won't be limited. You know, we're, we're very limited as to how far we can go, but uh, we have a whole universe out there, um, billions of light years across to explore in those brand new resurrected bodies. But in order to come into the presence of God, uh, we have to be perfected. The, the Bible says that um, without holiness, it's impossible to see the Lord. So we must be perfected, and that's what this bema, this judgment seat, this reward seat of Christ, this uh, wood, hay, and straw on the one hand, or silver, gold, and precious stones on the other hand, that's what this is all about. It's about us being perfected. And now, you know, we're, we're getting into the area of speculation here. Uh, that perfection that we have to have in order to come into the presence of God the Father, is it instant or is it progressive? Now, and personally, I hope it's kind of instant. I, I hope that, um, but I don't know, you know, I'm just, this is just my hope. Uh, I hope that um, you know, the instant that we, uh, that the moment we die, we stand before Jesus, we're in the presence of Jesus. Uh, he looks at us with those eyes that are like flames of fire, 
you know, as was described in the book of Revelation, and, and the fire of God's love, um, I, I hope, instantly burns away everything that is unlike Christ, everything that fits into the wood, hay, and straw category, and it instantly refines everything that's, that's, that is like Christ. Uh, the silver, the gold, the precious stones, uh, all those things, all those good works that we have done uh, unto the Lord. But I don't know for sure if it's going to be instant. Uh, probably the majority, of, well, I, sh I, don't, I shouldn't say that. A lot of Christians down through the ages have said, well, no, it's probably not instant. It's probably more progressive because it seems like, you know, just looking at ourselves that um, it, it takes a while for most of us to get it. We, we, we don't um, just pop into instant perfection, you know. Uh, we have to study. We have to learn. I mean, that's, that's the way everything is. You don't just uh, one day pick up a violin and, and be a virtuoso. It takes years and years and years of practice and uh, effort uh, to perfect, um, you know, that instrument or that language or that uh, technique, whatever it is. So a lot of Christians uh, down through the ages have said it's, it's more likely that it's progressive. And, and that's where the idea of purgatory originally came from. Now, purgatory is not in the Bible. Um, but uh, the idea originally, um, you know, um, back in the third century and so, uh, was that uh, purgatory was... Um, being brought into the presence of Jesus, and that the warm fire of God's love would, would slowly refine and change, uh, burning up little by little all the wood, all the hay, all the straw, uh, refining little by little the silver, the gold, the precious stones. Um, and then when we are uh, like Christ, then we can come into the presence of God the Father. That's, that's the way purgatory was originally thought of. Now, in the Middle Ages, um, that all got twisted around, and then, you know, purgatory in the Middle Ages became this place of torture, and uh, then it became a, um, you know, a way to sell indulgences. Which really, when you think about it, it was probably the, the, the greatest... Um, a money scam, you know, in, in all of history, you know, convincing everybody that uh, after you die, you're, you, you have to spend um, eons in this uh, torturous torture fire chamber, you know, and, uh, that, and then they would sell indulgences, you know, do you remember your sweet mama? Well, she's being tortured right now in the fires of purgatory. And, but if you make a donation so that we can build St. Peter's Cathedral, We'll write you an indulgence, and you can get her out or get her out sooner or something. So um, th that all came about in the Middle Ages, but that wasn't the original um, idea be behind the concept of purgatory. It was just that uh, the feeling that um, th th the distance between me now and perfect has a long way to go. And, and so God, God has to bridge that gap before I can live forever in the presence of God. That was the idea behind that. Um, so there's a lot of speculation, but there are some things that we do know. We know that we have to be refined. We know that without holiness, we can't see the Lord. We know that we're going to stand before the Bema, the reward seat of Christ, um, and our works are going to be judged. We know that some of what we do fits into that silver, gold, precious stones category, and some of what we do fits into the wood and the hay and the straw category. And we also know, and please, please keep this in mind, no matter what, you're accepted. <laughs> We're not talking about, you know, um, dying and standing before the Lord and, and, and suddenly realizing that you're on the outside. No, God loves you. God loves you unconditionally. Jesus died for your sins. Uh, sin is off the table. It's as far away as the east is from the west. So far has he removed our transgressions from us. He's cast all our sins into the deepest sea. Uh, he even has erased them from his own mind. So that's not the issue. Uh, the issue is just that we need to be refined, uh, 
Yeah, so that we're pure gold, so that we're pure silver, uh, so that we can live forever in the presence of a holy God. So what makes the difference? You know, when, when we do something in everyday life, uh, is what we're doing, is it, is it silver, gold, or is it wood and straw? Uh, what makes the difference there? The answer to that, as you might suspect, is love. Cruciform love, love that looks like the cross, like we've been talking about in our study in Revelation. It's agape love. It's the love that is um, unconditionally given and unconditionally received. It's the love that Paul describes in Galatians chapter 5. Um, you know, we, we uh, hear all the time, you know, there's nine fruits of the Spirit, but that's not what Paul said. Um actually, and I, and I know, you know, I get the Sunday school trees with, you know, it's got bananas and apples and all this stuff hanging on it, and each one's a different fruit, and um, that's fine. But what Paul actually said was the fruit, singular, of the Spirit is, that's a singular verb, love. And then if I were translating it, I would put a stop there or a colon there. And then he goes on to describe the things of which love consists, joy, peace, long-suffering. Most of our translations say patience. I, I like the, the word long-suffering better. It's an older word, but it's uh, to me it, um, it, it carries more weight than patience. Uh, love consists of joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, or that word can be translated kindness, and self-control. We're talking about self-sacrificial, enemy-forgiving love that looks like the love on the cross. It, we're talking about viewing every other person in the world as the Imago Dei, the image of God. Uh, I read somewhere the other day that uh, there's an old Jewish proverb uh, that says, um, in front of every human being is an angel proclaiming, behold, the image of God. Isn't that beautiful? If we start looking at people the way God sees people, oh, it'll transform our relationships. It'll transform our lives. So now if you're uh, following along in a, you know, a Bible that you're taking notes in or uh, underlining stuff, flip over to chapter 13, uh, where, which Paul describes as the more excellent way. We want to create works that bring glory to God and are going to shine forever, glorifying God forever. Uh, the silver, the gold, the precious stones that we create through our good works um, will, will bejewel the heart of God forever and ever. But what is this love like? Well, Paul gives us this beautiful description, and, and, you know, you're familiar with this passage, and I think it's such a shame that we just read it at weddings, because um, that isn't the context of it. Not that it doesn't apply there, but it applies much more than that. If I could speak in all the tongues of earth and of angels, but didn't have love for others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and I, if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud. Love is not rude. Love does not demand its own way. Love is not irritable. Love keeps no record of being wronged. Love does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. 
Prophecy and speaking in unknown tongues and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only a part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, when we're all perfected and standing before God, these partial things will have become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child, but when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. So Paul is telling us there that anything we do and everything we do that's motivated by love, God's love, cruciform love, not self-love, not doing the things so that you'll love me back, not doing the things so that you'll recognize me and give me a prize, but uh, doing it just out of an altruistic heart for God. Anything that's motivated by God's cruciform agape love is permanent. It lasts forever. It's like silver. It's like gold. It's like precious gems. It glorifies God forever. And of course, the opposite is also true. Anything that we do that's not motivated by love is worthless. It burns up from an eternal point of view. Now, when I say it's worthless, it may have some worth here in this life. You know, so someone may, um, you know, make make a ton of money and donate a ton of money to uh, build a new wing on the hospital or whatever, and uh, name it after himself and and uh, really enjoy the accolades. And you know, he he's done a good thing. Um, now the hospital has a has a a better space and they can treat more people. And and that, there's nothing wrong with that. But from an eternal perspective. He doesn't get any credit for that, you know, If unless his motive was agape love. If his motive is get my name on the building so, so that people will think I'm wonderful, um, then uh, he, he won't receive any reward for that. So how do we mature so we can bear fruit? We, we must grow up. We have to spiritually, we need to bear fruit. And the fruit that we need to bear is the fruit of love. The fruit of, spirit, of the Spirit is love. And if love is motivating the things that we do, and again, I'm talking about cruciform love, if that's motivating the things that we do, then our fruit is going to last forever. On the other hand, if what we do is motivated by something else, then um, it's, it's not going to do us any good might help somebody else, but it's not doing us any good. So here's where we get the the the, the five steps that I uh, opened up with. Uh, the first one, uh, first thing we do. Well, I should say the first thing we do is make sure you're reading your Bible and spending time in prayer because that's the only way to know God. So that I that that's a prerequisite, knowing God. Um, then once you got that down, and that's, you know, ingrained habit in your life, then the next thing we need to do is to allow the, the various, um, I, I said fires, you know, in quotes, uh, we all go through trials and tribulations. We all, all go through difficult times uh, at different stages in our life. They might be physical difficulties. They might be um, emotional difficulties or relational difficulties or financial difficulties or vocational difficulties. I mean, you know, the, lots of trials and tribulations in lots of different areas. Jesus said, in the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Um, the Apostle Paul said, all who would live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. He didn't say you might. <laughs> Um, so we all go through various kinds of fires in our lives, but it's up to us whether or not we allow those difficult things that we go through to uh, make us more like Jesus or not. Um, we all need to learn 
as we face those difficult things, and the difficult things are going to come whether we want them or not, whether we face them or not. Um, but if we can learn in the midst of them to let go of our need to control, to let go uh, of our need to know everything, if in the midst of those things we can come back to that place of faith and trust, God, I, I don't know what's going on here. I don't understand why this is happening, but I trust you. Um, not that God causes those things. I don't mean that. He, he does not. Um, the, the bad things that happen to us uh, are either caused by Satan or they're caused by ourselves or by other people. Um, they, uh, um, it, it's not that God causes them, but, you know, all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So in the midst of those things, which are difficult, not caused by God, but difficult, we need to remember that God's with us. We need to fall back on what we do understand. I don't know why this is happening, but I do know that God is with me. Uh, I, I can't figure this thing out, but I do know that, that God's got me. And we need to be okay with ambiguity. We don't have to have all the answers. And a lot of times we just don't have the answers, and, and that's okay. Allow that thing that we're going through to make us more like Jesus. Romans 5, beginning in verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Uh, no, notice the section there that I highlighted. But we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Mm. Uh, I think the King James says, tribulation works patience. That's why, you know, people jokingly say, I never pray for patience, because you pray for patience and God's going to get out the plow of <laughs> tribulation. Uh, but God doesn't cause those things, but we, we can glory in our sufferings, not, not because we enjoy suffering, not because the thing that's happening to us is a good thing, but we're rejoicing because that which we're going through is developing perseverance within us, and that's developing character, and the character is developing hope, and so forth. So, even though we hate to admit it, we, we really do need to fail. <laughs> uh, we don't go out purposely to fail, but, you know, we need to stumble. We need to fall. And for a child to learn to walk, she needs to fall down and skin her knees sometimes. I know we'd like to put her in a bubble so that nothing bad ever happens to her, but uh, that's not good for a person. Uh, Julian of Norwich was a um, um, Christian in the Middle Ages, uh, lived in England, and, and she said, first there is the fall, and then we recover from the fall. Both are the mercy of God. I mean, think about that for a moment. You know, I mean, most if you're like me, you think the recovery from the fall, yeah, that's the mercy of God. Oh, hallelujah, praise the Lord. But she's saying more than that. She's saying first there's the fall, then we recover from the fall, and both are the mercy of God. Not that God pushed you over, but God allowed the fall in his grace, in his love, in his mercy to make you more like him. But again, that's where a free choice comes in. You don't have to let the fires that you go through form you into the image of Christ. You can um, put up resistance to that. The second thing we need to do is to make sure that we have a single focus, talking about how we mature spiritually. 
first thing we need to do is recognize the trials and tribulations that I go through. Oh, God, in the midst of this whole thing, I'm, I'm going to trust you. Work your work. Refine me. Make me more like Jesus. Then we need to make sure that our focus is on Jesus. Uh, first part of Hebrews 12, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so you will not grow weary and lose heart. Again, uh, look at the part that I highlighted. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Uh, how many Olympic runners will tell you that the race is lost if you, grant, if you glance sideways? You never, you never look at the person in the lane next to you. You fix your eyes on that tape, on that finish line. And you give it all you've got to get to that finish line. If you're looking around you, it's going to slow you down. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. The, the, the phrase, consider him, uh, the, the word consider there, um, has the connotation of studying something carefully. Uh, I, I probably told you before, but um, I remember when I was a, a kid, my, my dad was a, an oceanographer, and um, I would go visit him in his laboratory. And uh, one time when I was a, a little guy, I was there visiting, and he put something or other under a microscope. And, and he said, uh, uh, you know, look in there, Larry, and tell me what you see. So I glanced in. I said, well, yeah, I see a bunch of squiggly things. He said, no, 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 really look. You know, take the, 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 the fine focus and, and go up and down through the layers of the liquid there and, and, then, and then move the slide back and forth and study it. And what do, you, what do you see? And a whole world that I didn't even know existed left forth right before my eyes, because I wasn't just looking, I was considering. Consider Jesus. Gaze into the heart of Jesus. Spend time in prayer, but not just telling Jesus the things you need or the things others need. That's perfectly good. Please do that. But also spend time just getting to know the heart of God just gazing into the heart of God. Uh, there, there are times when I, 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 I call it having coffee with Jesus. I don't know if he's drinking coffee, but I am. <laughs> and I, 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 I've been through my prayers. I've been through my, um, my devotional reading for the, for the morning. You know, I have Bible passages that I read and meditate on. I've been through all that. I've prayed for the family and all that stuff. And then, and then I'll just sit and just sit with Jesus. And, and try to listen. And, and sometimes he, he will speak. That's that, that sweet inner voice of love. That's Jesus talking to you. Consider him. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus. And number three, again, taken from that passage in Hebrews chapter 12, throw off the sin and the weight that besets you. Now, Sin, the word sin, means to miss the mark, literally. Uh, we would probably call those mistakes. Uh, you know, the things that we are in the habit of doing that we know we're just, we're, we're missing the mark here. N need to change some things. Uh, weights would be habits, attitudes, normal stuff, anything that gets in your way of growing in Christ. It's not necessarily anything bad. Um, the woman in the picture that I have on the slide here is uh, strapping on ankle weights for her workout. That's, that's all well and good, but she's not going to run a marathon with those ankle weights on. She's going to take those weights off. And we're in this race called Christianity. We're, we're in it to glorify God. And therefore, th there may be some things in our lives that are perfectly, they're not sinful, they're not bad things. No, and nobody would have the right to come and say, hey, you ought to get rid of this, that, and the other thing. But as we, we pray and, and seek God, we realize, hey, you know, this thing over here, it's slowing me down. 
And so I'm going to set that thing aside because I want to run this race to glorify God. Now, what I'd like to do in the next couple moments, and then I'll come back and give you numbers four and five, um, but I thought we'd spend about oh, 10 or 15 minutes in a couple of breakout groups. And these are the two questions that uh, I, I'd like you to, to talk about. And then, and then when we come back together, um, I'll finish up and then you can, you know, share, share what, uh, what you talked about in your group. Um, the first one is, uh, see, if you can think of one spiritual hindrance or weight in your life, not talking about sins, uh, you know, um, it's okay if you want to confess sin to each other, but uh, we're talking about just everyday normal things that maybe are slowing you down. And, and like I said, no fair naming your spouse as being that which is holding you down. As you reflect on your life thus far, can you think of a time when you went through the fire? Uh, I'm sure you can. Uh, well, you've been through trials and tribulations. But can you think of a time when you went through a difficult time and looking back on it now, it turned out to be a great blessing? So that that's... Um, what I would ask you to. Uh... <laughs> okay, I'll be. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so number four, uh, we need to run the race with endurance. So let me just back up real quickly here. Remember what first three are. We want our. Uh, where are we here? There we go. One more, one more. We allow the fires that we go through to make us more like Jesus. And then we keep our focus on Jesus. We throw off the sins and weights that easily beset us. And then we need to remember that this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Run with endurance the race that's set before you. And, and as we said, you, you do that by keeping your eyes on Jesus. You do that by asking God to show you what's holding you back. And you do that by asking for and trusting in and relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we, we can't run this whole race on our own steam. Um, you know, a lot of us, we, we, we come out of the blocks as... Uh, kids and we think, oh, man, I got this all taken care of, but it doesn't take too long in life. Usually by the time you're middle-aged, at least, uh, you start to realize I can't do this thing on my own. I, I need God. I need the strength, the power of the Holy Spirit. But the good news is that it's there. And then finally, something to remember. Please remember that you are God's beloved. That's your identity. Who are you? You know, somebody said, uh, who, who are you? What do you do? You know, you give your name. And I mean, typically in our culture, you give your name and, uh, you know, what, you, what you're doing in life. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a retired whatever I am, and, and I have this many kids and grandkids, that kind of thing. No, your essential identity is you are beloved of God. There is no condemnation to you because you're in Christ Jesus. And nothing can ever separate you from the love of Christ. And remember again, Romans 5.5, 5, where Paul said, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who's given to us. God has given you his love, not just to make you feel good, but also so that you can share it with others. There's a little Sunday school ditty we used to sing with the kids years ago that said, uh, um, a song isn't a song until you sing it, and a bell isn't a bell until you ring it. So the love in your heart wasn't put there to stay because love isn't love until you give it away. Oh, so, like that. you know, share, share the love of Christ with others. And, and the smallest thing that you do, motivated by love, is going to shine for the glory of God forever. You know, Jesus said, if you take a cup of cold water to a prophet in the name of a prophet, you'll receive a prophet's reward. Something as simple 
uh, as offering someone a drink of water who's thirsty, you know, um, that's going to last forever uh, because it's motivated by love. So, Lord God, we ask that you'd help us to run this race with endurance and produce in our lives works that in the end will be silver, gold, and precious stones. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Wow.